So let me welcome our guests, uh, Tu Nguyen, Policy Fellow on European Institutions and Democracy at the Jacques Delors Center at the Hertie School, John Morain, a Professor of Law and Politics in International Relations at the University of Groningen, and a Commissioner at the Netherlands Institute for Human Rights, and Alberto Alemano, who is a Jean Monnet Professor in EU Law at HEC Paris, and a founder of the Good Lobby. Welcome. To let me uh, kick off the discussion uh, with you and a question on the responsibility of the Commission. The von der Leyen Commission came into power saying uh, they want to restart the discussion on the rule of law, but it seems that they increasingly shied away from calling out member states and effectively um, uh, addressing this issue and sele selectively uh, enforcing uh, um, different issues. Uh, why do you think that is? What can uh, trigger the Commission into action? And how how sustainable do you think that position is of sort of trying to hold the center between member states who want more action and member states who are challenging the rule of law? Thank you, um, Esther, and also um, thank you to the permanent representation of the Netherlands and EU for the invitation um, and for organizing this panel on this very um, important and timely topic. Um, I think in terms of um, the Commission and why they have shied away, I think they have been very technical in, in the past when it comes to enforcing the rule of law and, and especially with the infringement procedures. Um, I think maybe there is somewhat of um, an hesitation to jump into enforcing um, values that are not as spelled out as perhaps European law, um, which is sometimes on. I think we will get to this. But I am hoping somewhat that with the new uh, mechanism that we have now with the new rule of law condition and mechanism, that that perhaps might change because it gives the Commission um, a, a new tool and a, perhaps a more effective tool also in, in countering rule of law breaches. And I think what is important here is that um, we have to sort of look at what is the, the purpose of um, intervening rule of law crisis. And I don't think that it is so much about sanctioning member states um, when they breach the rule of law, but that it's really about preventing them um, to breach the rule of law by being able to credibly threat them with sanctions. So it's about the credible threat of sanctions. And I do think that with the new mechanism that we have, this is um, much more possible than, than with other mechanisms um, that were there before. Of course, with infringement procedures, it takes a lot of time. Um, it takes the Court of Justice. Um, with Article 7, we have seen that it is um, perhaps much more of a toothless tiger than, than something that can really grip. And I think this is now different with the new rule of law mechanism where the funds can really be suspended through qualified majority voting and where the political backing is perhaps less um, less uh, less stringent than, than under the Article 7 mm -hmm. article. So I think that we are now, hopefully, or at least I'm hoping that we're now entering the phase where the Commission has a tool that it can use more easily and where it then perhaps also will be more, uh, how do you say, more likely or more, more, more um, incentivized um, to, to, to take action. And I think we've also seen that, in fact, conditionality has worked in the past. Eh? So, so back in 2012-13, um, the Commission did suspend cohesion funds for Hungary. Um, and, and the Council agreed. Um, it was for different reasons. It was macroeconomic reasons, um, so not rule of law reasons. But we have seen that conditionality has worked in the past. So Hungary was very quick to, in fact, um, rectify the situation um, when it was faced with with um, suspension of, I think it was 500 million euros, so quite a lot, a third of what was due to receive. So I think with that in mind, um, seeing that the suspension of funds or the threat has worked in the past, and now that there is this tool to use, um, perhaps the Commission will be more likely and more incentivized to, to use that also um, because it knows or because there has been precedence, it can work and be simply because there's no unanimity um, involved anymore. Let me ask uh, two quick uh, follow-ups. I mean, you mentioned the credible threat. The, the, the example you mentioned is a macroeconomic uh, issue. And I think that's a key difference because on values and rule of law, there's been, there seems to be, the problem is that there is no credible threat because there is no follow-up. And uh, just on the, on the conditionality, uh, Hungary and Poland said they will uh, challenge this uh, mechanism in the um, European Court of Justice and they will do so by mid-March. Do you think that the Commission will use this before there's a ruling? Uh, so there will there be a mechanism this year launched? 
I personally, I don't think the commission will use um, were worth well will impose sanctions before there is a ruling for for several reasons. I, I think that um, for one, the commission needs to make sure that the very first case it launches under this um, mechanism, that it is a watertight case and that takes time. It needs to take the time to prepare a proper case to make a watertight case and to ensure that it has the political backing, because if the first case fails, or if the commission fails to 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 get the political backing for the first case, I think that sets a very bad precedence for the mechanism as such. So I think for once it needs a time. And secondly, I think the problem is that until such times that the court has ruled, the commission will not get the political backing by the member states. So unless the, the council goes against the European Council conclusions, which seems very unlikely, the commission will not stand a chance in this mechanism. So from a practical point of view, I don't think the commission will launch a case or be able to impose sanctions um, simply because there won't be the member states backing. Um, so I think it will wait um, until there is a judgment um, simply for, for the reason that it will make it more likely to, to also mm -hmm. go through with this. And uncredible threats. I mean, are there credible threats, really? I think that very much depends on this very first, first case. I think there can be a credible threat. If the commission, the com if the commission now manages to, to build up a, a very good case um, in the very first one and, and gets the political backing of the member states, um, publicly also, and if the member states publicly um, stand behind the commission, I think there can be a credible threat, in fact. Mm. John, let me turn to you on, on the member states and, and this political backing. I mean, what is the responsibility here of the member states? The Article 7 is stuck in the Council. Uh, member states government last year kind of opened up uh, the this con conditionality mechanism to ambivalence. Uh, what, 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 what can be done here? What can uh, trigger this sort of political backing to the Commission that seems to be lacking so far? Well, first of all, uh, many thanks for inviting me. It's a nice homecoming as well for the, to the permanent uh, representation and uh, privilege amongst, uh, to be amongst these panelists. Um, I think that uh, um, what we see is uh, uh, a minority of real rule of law friends, a large uh, group of silent member states and a small minority of real uh, blockers. Uh, one of the things that is uh, currently lacking is simply uh, transparency in the council conclu in the council uh, discussions in the first place. I mean, it's it's strange that we have to only hear uh, indirectly what actually took place uh, and that these things are not uh, live streamed. I know that the Dutch government is very much a, in favor of that, uh, and and uh, so should we all. Uh, but if we look at uh, research, for example, done by Laurent Pesch. Uh, that uh, sees that that looks into who actually opens their mouth in, in Article Seven uh, proceedings. It's actually very few member states who do, who do, and and that is, in my view, that has to do with the fact that um, uh, we should uh, nationalize the EU rule of law debate. It should be the the most effective uh, democratic control of any member states is their national parliament. So in the Netherlands, for example, the, the our parliament is really quite on top of controlling uh, our government as a participant of the uh, of the, the the council discussions and you see that that uh, leads the, the Dutch government to take a more active role in uh, council discussions uh, that that uh, is unfortunately not really the case yet in many other uh, member states even if they on paper uh, say all the right things uh, and, and often wax lyrically about the importance so that's, uh, I think, uh, looking uh, at this uh, uh, from a glass half full perspective, also a huge chance. Uh, uh, recently, two rapporteurs in the Netherlands Parliament uh, relating uh, that, that are working on the rule of law reported that they want to continue uh, doing so uh, after a new government uh, takes uh, office. And uh, it's up to them also to uh, mobilize uh, their colleagues in other national parliaments to make sure that more and member states open uh, open up their um, uh, open up uh, a real discussion in the council. But if I may add one one point, you now frame the question uh, in 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 the way that uh, the commission is always sort of the good guy and the member states are the laggards. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that unfortunately the, the commission itself has uh, acted often much too slowly and uh, in uh, in an incomplete way. For example, with regard to judicial independence in, in Poland. 
uh, but also uh, uh, you mentioned in your introduction uh, media uh, freedom uh, both in Poland and in Hungary it's clear that the commission has done nothing there even if it uh, could but even more importantly it only talks down on member states in a sort of a top-down way and it has many tools that it can also use itself with regard for example the European Parliament there's a, a well-hidden secret uh, regulation that links uh, um, uh, funding for European political parties uh, to complying with the rule of law into that entered into force in 2014. It has so far been used exactly zero times. Why is that relevant? Because the very same national political parties that cause problems in Poland and Hungary now still sit in uh, EU funded European political parties and the European Commission could have triggered uh, in parallel, that procedure when it uh, uh, when it brought Poland to the uh, uh, to the Council in Article Seven, and the European Parliament could have triggered that uh, um, uh, that same procedure uh, when it brought uh, Hungary uh, to the to the European Parliament under uh, to to the Council under Article Seven. So it's it's also a matter of consistency uh, of uh, applying the law uh, uh, in uh, uh, to the same. Uh, problem in in different ways and the commission has been very much lagging there and so has the european parliament uh thanks for this i did not mean to imply that the commission is the good guy in this uh in this discussion uh you mentioned transparency what but what is the um what keeps member states uh governments away from speaking out publicly calling out other member states and maybe uh, convincing this uh, silent majority as you mentioned, to uh, support their side? Uh, there's different elements to that, Esther. Uh, first of all, if you think about this uh, with some distance, and I, I used to work inside, and now I have that distance as a, as a professor, it's actually quite strange to think that uh, ministers that are not actually responsible for the rule of law at home discuss the rule of law uh, at the EU uh, level. It's not ministers of justice or ministers of the interior or ministers of finance or economics ministers who deal with rule of law problems in all, all their aspects at home. It's uh, uh, foreign affairs ministers who uh, come to uh, a discussion mainly from uh, diplomatic considerations. So that's one element to that. The second element is more fundamental uh, and that is, I firmly believe that many uh, um, ministers and many politicians in the EU have simply not internalized how big the problem is that there are two member states that really want to have their euro cake and eat it too and uh, and, and act against uh, uh, the, 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 the principle of sincere cooperation that they simply uh, misuse procedures and, 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 and play for time uh, in, in an EU uh, setting. That has not been internalized by many uh, EU member states. Every time I uh, give talks to politicians, they are sort of baffled if you give sort of a, a rundown of simply what has happened over the last year and a half in Poland alone. It's a huge information gap and I also think that uh, as we sit around the digital table here, it's our task, uh, for example, by, by having a seminar like today's to fill that information go, uh, gap, but also to offer uh, ways to, to act on, on what we know. And there's many different uh, tools that can be used. Uh, tool was already mentioning one, there's, there's, there's many others that are already available. Um, Alberto, let me turn to you on this, uh, you know, internalizing the question. I think it's a it's a key issue because there seems to be either on the Commission side or member state side, and often in the Parliament as well, a lack of political will to pursue these issues. Um, the European Council, the highest body of EU leaders, has actually never discussed the rule of law concerns. It has discussed the conditionality as part of the EU budget, but it has never reached a point where they would discuss it uh, among themselves. What what could uh, trigger this um, your, uh, internalization and 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 political will that would enable then the EU institutions perhaps to step up more effectively? Thank you, Esther, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I agree with what has been said so far. Uh, the European Union has all what it needs uh, to uphold the rule of law. If this is not happening, it's because there are deeper reasons. And I think uh, both speakers before me, they start in unpacking some of the reasons why there hasn't been enough awareness, there hasn't been enough political will to actually make full use. If you think about Article 7, we have been obsessing 
uh, for many years about the uh, ineffectiveness of this procedure, but we have never used it till the very end. So we never found our, ourselves in experience in which such a veto uh, would have been posed, which of course is quite self-explanatory of the situation in which we are in the overall limited debate uh, that this existential matter cause within the union. Uh, I think time has come to um, uh, unlock the unpass in which we are. Uh, this is an issue where we need to take a much broader perspective. It's not only the job of the Commission alone to act in a top-down perspective. The Commission itself has to uh, be helped uh, by other actors, notably uh, civil society organizations, which so far have been, I would say, bystanders of a phenomenon which was bigger than themselves, which was threatening their own existence. If you think about the situation in Hungary and also in other countries today in which we witness a sort of shrinking space for, for civil society. So I think time has come to look at other actors, trying to look at how we can potentially increase such an awareness and how we can enhance the advocacy capacity of other actors. I think the most neglected actor in the current conversation is really civil society itself. And when I say civil society, I'm not only referring to the hundreds of NGOs whose mission is to uh, hold accountable decision makers, but I'm also thinking about their donors, the foundations that help them to exist and to pursue uh, this, this kind of job. They are not very active in this particular conversation, is a bit too political for them, so they don't engage. And when they do, they are not necessarily very well positioned to play uh, such a role. Uh, it is also important to remember, uh, I think another actor, uh, which is often omitted, but is in a way is the elephant in the room, uh, which is uh, the business sector, the private sector, uh, which is partly damaged by the erosion of the rule of law, including the lack of judicial independence in certain countries, the erosion of media freedom. But these uh, private businesses historically have been very reticent in speaking out and in challenging uh, go governments be before courts, the very same courts, uh, in the country in which they make investment. I think this is a major taboo. But if you think about all those actors ranging from uh, NGOs to foundation and philanthropies and the private sector, all those actors' mobilization could have rendered the job of the European Commission in particular, and also the other institutions, including the parliament, much easier. Right, We lack a counterfactual. We don't know how Europe would look like if all those actors have, had mobilized from the bottom up, but certainly they would have increased the kind of awareness John was uh, mentioning as lacking, and they would have created the kind of political appetite for action that at the moment, even in a situation which is much more pathological than three or five years ago, still is not there, right? Uh, as uh, to already mentioned and anticipated, the parliament is, doesn't seem willing uh, to fight uh, against the conclusions that basically re uh, redrafted uh, the very same uh, rule of law regulation that should enable uh, the Commission to, to act. I think this is probably the, the, the worst signal uh, that the Parliament may give uh, to, 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 to the European citizens uh, themselves. There is not ready to fight uh, to defend the prerogatives it has uh, as, a, as the House made of directly represented citizens today. Let me just ask on civil society, because to me it seems that uh, civil society is active. I mean, just to, looking at the Commission's rule of law, annual review, uh, the, the uh, reports even cited in, in the Article 7 procedure, the, the reports of NGOs uh, cited in the uh, Parliament report that triggered Article 7 against Hungary, isn't that more of, uh, that that uh, the the governments in Hungary and Poland have been successful in pushing uh, NGOs to decide, uh, uh, you know, politicizing the debate in such that in such a way that uh, that it's it's become even politically controversial to you know cite NGOs or civil civil organizations. 
There's no doubt. Over the last few years, we've witnessed a stigmatization of NGOs all across Europe, not only in Hungary or in Poland, but also in the country where I know best, which is Italy, where you know NGOs are the object of any kind of accusations when it comes to the political debate. But it's also true partly in Spain, where we also witnessed an emergence of new regulation that shrink the space, that limit the ability of NGOs to act. But there are systemic structural issues uh, that nobody is really tackling today. The advocacy capacity, the ability of NGOs to be professionalized in the way in which they engage with government is still not there. And this is due to a variety of historical and sociocultural reasons that have rendered NGOs and civil societies always by definition weaker than other actors. They don't receive the same funding, they don't have the same ability to mobilize and get into society. And when they wake up, obviously this is too late. It is too, too, too late for uh, somehow catching up and being able to create in a transnational manner resistance. So without going too far, let's think about a scenario in which the NGOs in Hungary would have started collaborating with the NGOs in Poland. The Polish authorities follow the very similar playbook as the Hungarian one. But those NGOs, and I witnessed myself in my own experience, they didn't cooperate among themselves for too long. And the same is happening in other corners of Europe. And this lack of transnationalization of civil society mobilization uh, weakened as opposed to strengthened the ability of NGOs, which by definition, again, are resourceless or limited in their ability to speak up and to make such a difference. So there's a huge, huge uh, conversation we should have in the future about how we can equalize access to power, how we can equalize the ability of all civil society organizations to actually make a difference when engaging with public authorities. At the moment, we are not there. The situation is structurally predetermined and in a pathological situation like the one we are describing, obviously this inequality of access makes things completely more complicated and completely impossible and unviable uh, for, for NGOs themselves. Let me uh, turn the uh, turn to the future a little bit because um, because yes, there are new tools. Yes, perhaps the conditional tool, tool will uh, you know bring forward a credible threat that would sort of, sort of um, uh, uh, alleviate some of some of the concerns. But um, you know the the the, uh, the lack of uh, respect for European Court of Justice decisions, uh, the, the various. Um, value-based uh, issues in the council that now you know only go forward with 25 24 member states like gender issues um, but more broadly you know this issue seems to be uh, threatening the functioning of of the eu itself where it would point to a um, perhaps a solution where there would be a multi-speed Europe or different groups going forward, different groups forming different alliances. And there seems to be, so far, the, the, the calculation has, seems to be, let's, you know, have unity as, as the, the primary principle and then sacrifice perhaps or compromise here and there to keep that unity. How long that, you know, do you think that go on? And will there be, are we approaching a breaking point? When will member states or EU institutions realize that uh, you know the, the price that they are paying might be too high. Tu, could you start off? Um, I think that is a very good question, also a very difficult one. Um, my problem with this two-speed Europe or, or, or differentiated integration in terms of rule of law is always that it sort of leaves behind the citizens of the member states that breach the rule of law, right? So it's, it, this is not just about member state level and, and, and going further with member states, but it has direct impact also on the citizens in the member states concerned. So, so my problem with this idea um, somewhat is that do we just leave behind, in a sense, leave behind in the European integration process, the citizens um, in, in Hungary and Poland? So I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult consideration. Um, I, I, of course, I have no answer into when will be the breaking point. But I, I see some issues with, with the idea itself, um, I must say. Um, and also in terms of the future of the European Union, can then, because it the EU basically in, in, in a union where there's a rule of law union and then a union surrounding without rule of law. So I'm, I'm not seeing it so much as, as a very, um, well, long lasting solution perhaps for the EU as such to have two different groups of member states with and without rule of law, to put it very um, well, 
frankly or bluntly. So more effective uh, uh, discipline, enforcement, sanctioning would be a way out, in your opinion, rather than... I think it would be preferable, also from a mm. citizen's point of view. John, what is your take on, you know, have, are we, are, is the EU paying too high of a price to keep, to keep unity? Well, I mean, you framed this uh, in, in uh, the, your question a little bit in a way that uh, uh, we are uh, approaching uh, sort of a breaking point. I think that we are already sort of past uh, the, the moment of truth, to be honest. I mean, I, I represented the Netherlands for a long time in the, in the working group on fundamental rights. And I remember very well that Poland, for the first time, uh, made this position clear that uh, it could not support a completely... Uh, um, innocuous reference uh, to LGBTI uh, for the first time. And I remember the sort of the oxygen was sucked out of, of the air and nobody could really believe that. Uh, um, I was in, in the Court of Justice four times last year alone and I listened very closely to what the Polish representative uh, um, brought forward. And it's clear that it's a, uh, it's a completely consistent um, uh, a story uh, of uh, what, uh, in her view, the rule of law is, which is not uh, the, uh, as the rule of law is being defined as a matter of union law. It's a notion of the rule of law uh, that uh, defines the law as something that is adopted by a majority and should only be uh, applied to a majority and without any regard uh, for, for the minority or any regard for the independence of, of judges. Um, in my view, uh, this requires two things. First, uh, uh, simply use tools that are there more effectively. Infringements uh, uh, much more quickly. Uh, it's not uh, currently, uh, this is uh, often framed as, uh, for, for the commission as a discretionary power. But for me, it's an obligation of result. Uh, so it should look at, from it, uh, to that from, from, from that perspective. And also think about it as uh, self and light, uh, self, self, uh, self interest, because the Commission, I can assure you, is not going to achieve any of its own stated uh, uh, ambitions if it's not going to step up its game on, on the rule of law. That's only one aspect, because the other aspect, what I, I took up from listening to the, the, the representative of the Polish government in court, I mean, this is not a secret meeting, it's purely openly uh, stated is that, in fact, I also have to become much, much better, Esther, in explaining what the rule of law is, what are the basics, uh, in a much more concise uh, way. So it's also very much looking in the mirror and realizing that we have to get much better at that, like Alberto said, mobilize uh, around that and, and make sure that uh, we vocalize better that the majority that I uh, that is now silent, as I described it uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. Poland and Hungary, and I think particularly Hungary, has uh, has been arguing that uh, there is no clear definition of, of rule of law. Um, it, it, does this? Do you think it has an impact? Like, uh, uh, that, is this, you know, destabilization of of uh, basic um, concepts uh, working? And what can be done to tackle that? Well, it's a, it's a powerful frame, but it's completely wrong. Uh, there's nothing unclear about the rule of law. It's a legally binding concept. And uh, if, if you look at it uh, from a, a glass half full perspective, it's precisely because some uh, countries have been denying this. We now have much clearer definition of what is judicial independence because of the Court of Justice. Uh, we have much stronger uh, positioning, for example, also in the context of the, uh, the uh, European semester recommendations that bring in uh, concepts with regard to judicial independence, etc. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't think that there's anything uh, unclear as a matter of law about the rule of law, but as long as you uh, uh, go along with the frame that something is unclear and you can talk about this endlessly only in, in, a, in a political dialogue without actually using the tools to apply this as law and enforce it as law, then uh, you're going to uh, see that that frame becomes much more powerful. Mm. Alberto, what is your take on uh, the future functioning of the EU and are we paying too much of a price? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily see a, a breaking point. Uh, Europe looks more like the, the frog in the, in, the boiled, uh, in the boiling pot, right? It's something very incremental. Uh, we, we, the, the frog doesn't realize the temperature is going up. 
but at some point it's going to be his life is going to be over right this is is this metaphor i think uh somehow captures the feeling we have i mean it's getting <coughs> worse and worse uh, we are moving from one crisis to an, a, another crisis the rule of law was the only stumbling block before the adoption of the European budget, the next generation EU. This was the central issue. And this is, ex is existential. It's about how the EU can actually uh, fund itself on the market and can create this major uh, uh, EU self-imposed Marshall Plan right, for, for Europe. I mean, this is at the center. That's what we all should be discussing about. But even observers, they bypassed the rule of law issue. It was all about the next generation EU without even realizing that this is not a done deal, right? That we still have the own resources decision that has to be ratified and we, we are still in the middle of it. And what, what, what is at the center is the rule of law conversation. And that's why the European Parliament won't challenge the European conclusion because they are very afraid that Poland and Hungary could still uh, somehow pose their veto on the own resources and damaging the entire edifice that everybody has been celebrating. I think what is going to be making a difference in the coming weeks and months is the increased awareness that the lack of the rule of law in Europe produces cross, uh, cross border effects, meaning that the fact of not having an independent judiciary in Poland or in Hungary or having media freedom threatened in Slovenia today is producing effect beyond the border. This is not a matter of three member states. This is a matter of all the union and European citizens themselves. Companies are affected by it. We are all on the same boat. When this awareness will emerge, there will certainly be more political will to have citizens, NGOs, philanthropies, all possible actors of civil society to play a greater role in it. It will probably be late, hopefully not too late, to witness this kind of mobilization. In a nutshell, uh, I think the rule of law agenda can no longer be an institutional agenda. It's not the commission job. It's, it's a co-owned agenda by civil society organizations that all, every single day, they need to play a role in it. Let me get a couple of questions in from the audience. A question from uh, Martin. There is much discussion on open strategic autonomy and projecting the EU's values abroad. How does deteriorating democracy and rule of law within some of the EU's member states affect the EU's capacity to project those common values externally? Two, can you perhaps address that? It wasn't specified, who is it for? Uh, please, yes. if you ask a question, uh, Please specify who is it for. I would pass it to you now. Yes. Um, well, I think this has perhaps been been a problem all along that the EU has um, been much stricter and has had much stricter conditionality also with regard to law, um, with um, uh, with regard to external actors and with regard to third countries than it has had um, in for for its own member states and, and inside of the EU and. Um, of course, it poses a problem because it also projects an image of, of double standards. Why are there different standards um, once you're in the EU and for, for other actors? Um, so, so I very much agree with Alberto also that the rule of law situation is, is not internal ones. It has um, implications for, for all sorts of areas and for all sorts of countries. And it's, um, the external dimension, but also within the EU, of course, rule of law issues have um, implications for the internal market, for, for the freedom of movement, for the freedom of work. So perhaps this is also something that needs to be framed this way, that, that um, the breakdown of the rule of law in some member states has um, a dimension for vis-a-vis um, -vis third countries, a dimension for the internal market, a dimension, an economic dimension, of course. Um, so it goes much, much broader than that, and it's not confined to simply the, the EU 27. So I, I think it, it definitely has an impact. So it makes, it, it makes the EU more, more vulnerable. Uh, basically is what you're, you're saying. Uh, a question for John from uh, Willem Brinkman. Uh, recent events in the Netherlands, uh, the questionable le legislation with regard to the curfew, is this a breach of the rule of law? Uh, thank you, uh, Willem. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not entirely aware of what, uh, what happened with the curfew, uh, the uh, so, uh, like all COVID measures uh, in the Netherlands, there needs to be a legis uh, legal basis to put these in place. And what was happening recently was that 
uh, a legal base that uh, the D Dutch government chose, which is a sort of a general legal base on imposing curfews in in, in uh, situations of uh, extreme emergency, uh, uh, was uh, found uh, um, uh, faulty by uh, by a, a judge uh, uh, earlier last week, and on appeal, uh, and then an appeal court is actually still uh, hearing that argument. And in the meantime, the Dutch government has uh, put in place an alternative uh, legal base. Um, I think that, in fact, uh, Willem, uh, and to answer that question, uh, th this whole debate actually shows that uh, the rule of law is taken very seriously within uh, the Dutch uh, context, that the government proposes something, and this can be challenged by any citizen to an independent court, and even uh, uh, there you have uh, the, the possibility uh, to appeal. More generally, uh, of course, it's extremely important. That's what we have been doing also at the Netherlands Human Rights Institute to carefully look at the proportionality of each of these specific uh, measures um, uh, that that have uh, such a uh, that that have been put in place uh, for for COVID. And it's actually a, a difficult uh, thing to do because you don't really uh, know from uh, uh, from the data which of the specific measures. Uh, 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 has what percentage uh, uh, of, of effect on, on, on uh, uh, fighting uh, COVID. So if the general framing is uh, uh, this, uh, did, uh, did a recent outlawing uh, by, by this uh, judge uh, say something about uh, the, uh, the, the problems with the rule of law in the Netherlands, I would argue it's actually the opposite. It shows that uh, we have a well-functioning liberal democracy where uh, the government, even if it's, it imposes uh, rules that are extremely important um, uh, still has to comply with the ruling of an independent judge and, and uh, will have to uh, come up with an alternative. John, we have, uh, I think this question is also for you uh, from Oliver Grimm uh, from the Austrian Die Presse. Could you please elaborate on why the Commission didn't raise the issue of political party funding uh, with Hungary and Poland or Poland? Thank you, Oliver. Uh, and Alberto also knows a lot about this. This regulation 2014 uh, 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 is, uh, is a sort of a well-hidden secret. Uh, I, I think it has to do with uh, the party political aspects uh, of this. For those of you who don't know the, what is the actual mechanism, uh, so a European political party is a federation of national political parties, at least from a, a quarter of all uh, member states. And they're receiving uh, funding from uh, EU taxpayer uh, money. And they will only continue to receive such uh, funding if in its program and actions, a European political party uh, complies uh, with, um, uh, with Article 2 uh, values. Um, now, uh, it, it has never been really clarified why the Commission has not uh, simultaneously brought that uh, uh, such a claim when it brought uh, to uh, uh, Poland to the uh, um, uh, to the Article Seven procedure within uh, in, the, in the Council. Uh, the the PIS party in Poland is a, um, a member of the ECR uh, political party and group, so it's not even a, a party in the European uh, Parliament that is uh, on which it uh, the, the Commission would heavily rely or the previous Commission for for its political agreement. Of course, with uh, Hungary and the European uh, People's Party and Fidesz, that is a different case. So I do think it is simply a lack of awareness, even inside of the, the, the European uh, Commission, uh, Oliver. And I find it extremely problematic because what, what we see is that uh, we now uh, have situations where we uh, confront, uh, uh, where we're trying to enforce the same law with regard to the same problem, with regard to the same member states in an incomplete and inconsistent way. And I think that's, problematic and, and that, that regulation needs to be much better enforced. And I was already re, uh, referring to what Alberto tried uh, to do together, together with Laurent Pers. The same regulation also makes it possible for a group of citizens to actually get the European Parliament to investigate uh, such a situation. And the, re the reply that uh, this group of citizens uh, um, uh, received from the European Parliament, which is always championing uh, being a uh, uh, rule of law uh, proponents was absolutely ridiculous. It was frankly uh, that uh, they had not uh, delivered uh, the signatures in the correct way, that they should have been digital rather than written or the other way around. And eventually this was never substantively uh, dealt with. So this is also something that uh, the European Parliament uh, needs to look into the mirror uh, uh, about. Alberto, I'll let you uh, 
go into detail if you want in a minute. Uh, but this next question also touches upon the, the Parliament, and and uh, I will I will uh, address it to you. It's a question by Julia. Uh, the EP was very vocal in December when the Council conclusions watered down the new regulation on conditionality. What happened to this enthusiasm to intervene in the case foreseen by the Hungarian and Polish government to fight the conditionality regulation? Do you think there is a chance to mobilize more political will, get back to the momentum of November and December? Uh, I'm glad to, to receive this question from Julia because it's really at the center uh, of what's happening now, right? Uh, the European Parliament making a lot of noise in the aftermath of the European Council conclusion in, on December 15th, reserving the possibility uh, to actually go to court uh, and to enforce and to use all tools available. And then what happened? Self-praise for turning the Hamiltonian moment into finally law this was December, then Christmas came. So everything, everybody forgot about it. And at the end of January, um, Antonio Tajani, as president of AFCO, decided to ask URI, the URI committee, to obtain a legal opinion by the European Parliament Legal Service uh, discussing the legality of the European Council and the possibility for the Parliament to challenge it. That legal opinion uh, that is not public, but uh, as anything in Brussels is circulating, it is uh, not very strong. It's a major political evaluation of what would actually happen if the parliament should challenge uh, the European uh, Council conclusion. The major argument would be, this is gonna be inadmissible, so we should not do it. And even if we do it, we are gonna create somehow a precedent, uh, the fact that the European Council conclusion could be challenged, and this might actually backfire. Um, this legal conclusion is already producing a um, major chill effect within AFCO, so a uh, writing procedure is ongoing and tomorrow will be closed, and it's very likely that URI will follow that advice. That basically means that the Parliament will accept that uh, its own prerogative can be violated, can be breached by the European Council in the future. Uh, it basically is a giving up, not only of the Commission, but also of the Parliament of being the one calling the shot. The principle of interinstitutional balance is at stake. The Council, our head of state and government, anytime can give instructions, can suspend, amend acts which have already been going through the Parliament and the Council, and they've already been negotiated like the political agreement we had on the rule of law. This is a very bad negative precedent uh, that nobody dares to correct, and the Court of Justice cannot do it itself. You know, somebody has to bring this case and the time is up. You know, it's just a matter of a few weeks uh, before the Parliament still has the possibility to challenge it. The other argument, which I think is worth mentioning, is that if Hungary and Poland will challenge the legality of the uh, rule of law mechanism, which is uh, kind of imminent. Uh, there are still a, a, a few, a couple of weeks to go. Well, the Parliament, as the Commission, could intervene. Hmm? We don't see the Commission to be very convinced uh, on, on this intervention, uh, but what the Parliament could argue. And the Parliament will also be chilled in raising the issue of the legality uh, of the rule of law regulation in light uh, of these conclusions which have been rewriting it. So there's still a lot of concern that the Parliament could play a meaningful role in the uh, judicial review of the rule of law regulation. So I'm afraid I don't have necessarily good news uh, in terms of a guardian of the treaty, master of the treaty. Again, my call is to have more people acting uh, on behalf of the European Union interest in a situation like this one, because the institutions are captured, the institutions are conflicted. This is a legal issue, it's not a political issue, but it has been transformed by the legal service of the European Parliament as the ultimate political issue. Let me stay with the with the Parliament for a minute, because uh, there is also massive uh, responsibility for the uh, specific political parties in the parliament, because regardless of uh, what is going on, it seems uh, that they're more than willing, obviously, to protect their own in the various member states. Um, again, basically, it, will there be a breaking point? Uh, you know, obviously, maybe uh, the, the question that has been most in the limelight is the question of EPP and Fides, but it's not only 
that I, I think there was one, only one time in the parliament where there was an overwhelming majority for rule of law issues, which was when they triggered uh, the Article 7 against Hungary. But let's not forget, it came after a Hungarian government campaign against uh, Commis uh, Commission President Juncker, also an EPP member. So. Um, would that is this would that be an effective tool uh, if if uh, 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 parliament political parties would draw a line in the sand and suspending members and uh, you know rearranging party lines uh, based on on respect of rule of law and European values? Do you wanna to do you want to take take that? Yes, thank you very much. Can I just make maybe one little point about the European Council conclusions that I bet you made? Um, because I, I, in fact, see it much less critical um, um, what the European Council conclusions um, did and said. Um, at the end of the day, they by and large stuck to what the text of the reg regulation says. And I think that much of the critique um, must also be seen in, in, in the light of why this compromise came about and why this deal was struck. Because it was not simply because the, well, it wasn't just for compromise didn't happen for 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 the sake of a compromise. There was the the recovery fund on the line. There was billions of of, of euros and the MFF and the budget on the lines. And there were a lot of member states dependent or waiting for that much needed money um, during an economic downturn and and during a second wave of of the crisis. So I think that there are problems with the conclusions, but by and large, I don't see it as critical. Um, in light of why it happened and when it happened, um, just um, to quickly make that point. Um, and the other question um, about the the role of the the parties, um, yes, I think I think that would definitely be a way. Um, that is also I think something that has been said um, in the past um, that the EPP simply doesn't take as much of a stance as as it should against its own members. Um, and that is, in, in, in fact, a problem. And it's, um, I think that that is maybe also a question that goes back to what Alberto said before and, and John said before, that the pressure needs to be also on the domestic parties um, to ensure that they take action at EU level. Um, and, and if the framing is different, if, if then the framing is that the rule of law issues in these countries really have an effect also in other member states at domestic level and for the EU as a whole, and where the pressure also is sort of put on, on, on the political parties um, that are part of the PP, perhaps that could change something. Um, so I, I do think that it is a problem and I think that perhaps a, a framing of how the rule of law issues affect also the citizens of the other member states and, and if that pressure can then be put on to the domestic agenda, um, perhaps that can change something. I think Esther, this is a is a is a critical critical point where we disagree with you, right? We are giving away the respect to the rule of law, which is the foundational element upon which the European integration has been created, in to the benefit of a short term, you know, fix that is going to help us to overcome the current crisis. But the rule of law is damaged, so next time we need it, it's not going to be there, and we're not going to have the credibility to step in. You know, this is foundational. This is structural. This is something we're going to regret in the coming months. So I don't accept any justification in terms of politics of the moment, because this is not a wise choice. It's going to backfire. But can I just simply say, but we do have a mechanism in the end. I mean, it, it's not as if they sacrificed the mechanism for the recovery fund. We do have a conditioning mechanism and we do have a recovery fund. The problem is that since gen we are at the end of February and there were events that would have justified the European Commission to trigger the application of the rule of law mechanism, because as you know, there's a long administrative process well before suspension can be asked to the Court of Justice. And I don't hear, I didn't hear the Commission to even mention such an instrument. That means that the European Council conclusion have suspended the application of such a regulation. It, it also means that they made it conditional upon the implementation of guidelines which were not foreseen in the legislative instrument. So here we have the smoking gun, right? The fact that we are at the end of February and the Commission is not even mentioning the rule of law mechanism that should be using because there are facts justifying the triggering of the rule of law. I think this speaks for itself. It seems like uh, a trend that uh, there always seems to be a bigger crisis than the rule of law and 
it, it seems to me as well that the rule of law takes a second seat to to other issues and this is what i refer to unity in in terms of like getting the recovery fund through at the cost of perhaps coming to a breaking point on rule of law uh, is is something that it seemed to me like happened in december as well but it's true there is a mechanism uh, and it seems like there's there needs to be a lot more discussion on this uh, conditionality mechanism because there's basically since july since uh, the conclusions in july were adopted and it was it, it opened up, it opened it up to all sorts of ambiguities and and controversies um john do you want to come on this you know on this yeah i mean uh, i'm i'm uh, i'm, I'm uh, looking at this fireworks uh, my my position is very much in the middle my starting point is that Council conclusions are not actually legally binding. Uh, and so if this is a fix uh, that uh, works both ways, uh, I'm in admiration of the council legal service. I do see the uh, I, I do see the the potential for damage that uh, Alberto is uh, 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 painting, uh, but I I, I I just don't think that um, uh, as an independent. Uh, 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 Commission, it should uh, in any way let its own enforcement be uh, dictated by the European Council because it's not the slave of the European Council. It's an independent political institution. Uh, to to come back to your question, uh, Esther, about European political parties, right? Why, is it only a Fidesz problem with the European uh, People's Party? It's definitely not. Part of the reason why this is problematic and uh, why, uh, why Oliver uh, asked earlier, why is this thing not enforced? It's because it's a, a, a question of a mutual hostage taking. Each uh, a mainstream political party has its own uh, bad apples uh, inside. So in my view, uh, two things need to happen and the European Commission can do this uh, with its democracy action plan. First of all, uh, the logic of this, um, uh, uh, of this instrument needs to be changed in the following way. If there's one uh, uh, criminal or, or suspect um, uh, member in, in, in a whole European political party, the whole European political party's uh, uh, finance line should be immediately cut. It should not be the, 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 the one component of every European uh, political party being uh, problematic from the viewpoint of Article 7 should immediately suspend uh, uh, financing for, for the whole uh, political party. But that's not even the most important issue. The bizarre situation at the moment is that we have both European political parties and European political groups that are oftentimes 90% overlapping and they're governed by different regimes. Political groups are, uh, are governed by the, uh, by the rules of procedure of the European Parliament itself that can be simply changed by a simple majority in European Parliament. Uh, while European political uh, uh, parties, uh, uh, it's, it's simply the ordinary legislative procedure where the Commission has uh, the right of initiative and both the European Parliament and the European uh, and, and the Council of Ministers as co-legislators need to regulate uh, things. I, I think uh, there's a lot of arguments for the European Commission to say that sim simply because political parties and groups are so closely related in their functioning and uh, they should be uh, uh, they should be regulated in the same way in, in under the ordinary legislative procedure uh, and not simply by by a majority uh, decision of the European Parliament itself, uh, so that we get this very strange situation that uh, Fidesz is suspended from uh, uh, from the party, but not from the group, which uh, is hard to uh, explain even to insiders. Mm. Let me just be the devil's advocate of, of, uh, on the on the um, council conclusion on the conditionality, and let, and then let's move uh, on to questions because uh, thankfully we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. I know the European Council conclusions are not legal documents, but Orban, you know, for example, Orban is arguing, you know, this is the highest political body, and it is a difficult political argument to make that, you know, this should be sidelined because it's not it's not a, a, a legal text. Um, a question from Jakub uh, uh, Jarajewski, and uh, I will ask. John, on this, what are your thoughts on the rule of law, on the EU rule of law report? Uh, what use for it in the EU rule of law toolbox? I, yeah, is it uh, a thank you, uh, Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, my view of that is very dim. Uh, I think it's a waste of time, to be honest, uh, because it distracts from uh, uh, 
uh, from discussing the rule of law as law, uh, because we pretend it, it's a tool that is used in the frame that the rule of law is something that is so unclear and that we have insufficient information about it that we need to endlessly draw on uh, updating our resources to figure out what's going on. That's simply not the case. That's not the problem. It delays uh, what the real uh, issue is. Uh, and and in, in that sense, it's damaging. Uh, another uh, issue with this is that it, uh, uh, it, it uh, uh, facilitates false equivalences. There's liberal democracies and, 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 and two <coughs> states at the moment that are simply no longer liberal democracies. Uh, so you cannot really compare these two things uh, uh, and, and because that, that will not uh, and give any sort of useful uh, uh, conclusions in, in my view. Uh, on the other hand, as a, as a former diplomat, talking about it and putting things on the agenda is itself already often a, a relevant sort of step. Uh, but I don't think that we should uh, think too much about uh, the, the relevance of this and changing things uh, on the ground at all. Uh, uh, I, I see more danger that it draws energy out of uh, to, uh, using tools that are actually legally enforceable than that it has the advantage of uh, keeping uh, us updated, to be honest. Mm. A question for, for Alberto from Katarin Harmai, Hungarian journalist. Uh, do you see a need of a treaty change in the, uh, in the conference of the, on the future of Europe to have uh, more solid safeguards of the rule of law in the EU? Reform of the Article 7 procedure, for example. That's a, it's an excellent question. And obviously, uh, talking about treaty change is always a bit uh, frightening for, for everybody, in particular for the member states. My, my, my short answer is no, we, we don't need a treaty change for, for upholding the rule of law. We have uh, many mechanisms, probably too many mechanisms that also work as a distraction, as, as John mentioned in relation to the, to the report. So this is not really the issue. Uh, there is an interpretation of Article 7 that would allow us today uh, to overcome the veto issue, right? If we join uh, the two Article 7 procedure, we would immediately, almost automatically, uh, exclude the ability of Poland and Hungary to cover each other back. This is something we could do now. We should just interpret the rule of law mechanism for what it was meant to, which is to act as a extrema ratio when member states are pathologically departing from Article 2 values. We can do this now. We just need the political will. And that's why we need to create the political pressure from the bottom up, as we discussed earlier on. Very good question by Ben. And indeed, it's something we haven't covered yet. It's a question to all. The discussion so far seems to forego the central role played by Germany, who both in Parliament and Council has a decisive position, but at times seems unwilling to take up this issue and throw it full, through its full weight behind it. Uh, Chancellor Merkel openly questioned the use of the rule of law mechanism. Where does the reluctance come from and what signal does it send to the uh, beleaguered civil societies in the states where the rule of law is at stake? Uh, to, do you want to kick off on that? I think that is um, a very difficult question. I'm not sure I have an answer. Um, in fact, um, I, I, I don't necessarily remember her questioning the mechanism openly, um, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, Germany well, had, did have the council when, when it was negotiated. So, so they did play um, a role in getting the, the mechanism into existence. Um, in terms of what will happen now, I must say, I, I really, mm. I, I don't think I have an answer at this moment. Um, we of course, we'll see now with the elections coming up, um, whether that, that, that will change um, um, something. I think also the party itself perhaps is, is not on one single line either, right? So I, I'm, I'm not sure we can also speak about um, the CDU or CSU or e even the EPP as, as one coherent group, I think even there, there are divergent stances and, and, and approaches um, to, to the topic. Um, but I don't have a definite answer on, on what will happen on um, mm -hmm. the German side. John. If I may, Esther, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, uh, I, I don't live in Germany, so I'm perhaps a bit more free to <laughs> answer the question. Uh, 
I think that the answer is different uh, for uh, when you talk about Poland or when you talk about Hungary for Germany. Poland is simply uh, extremely complex for Germany because of the, the past and understandably uh, so. It's an important neighboring state. Um, uh, Germany uh, has never really uh, been very vocal about uh, the rule of law uh, simply for historical reasons inside of the European Union. For Hungary, it's much more uh, complex, uh, as some of uh, great journalists from, from Hungary uh, uh, made quite clear. Uh, uh, evidently, uh, uh, there's huge economic interest for Germany in Hungary, for example, in car production, etc. And, and I, I, in my view, uh, uh, the point that I was making earlier about the European Commission not being able to achieve its goals, uh, uh, its own stated ambitions, without uh, 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 prioritizing the rule of law also goes for the German position. It's nice uh, that it is now uh, getting what it wants in terms of its car industry, but eventually it will do much more damage by continuing that and thinking about this only economically by uh, uh, by, by seeing then then by seeing the need for the for the rule of law to be protected and ingrained uh, more generally. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think it, 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 it does, uh, it is definitely worthy uh, um, uh, uh, of deeper reflection of how we can reach uh, those uh, in Germany who think about this purely uh, economically and make perhaps a, a, an economics based argument about uh, the, uh, the protection of the rule of law rather than a value based uh, argument. Uh, but it's, it's in fact an extremely important question that Ben is asking because that's where really the bottleneck is. Do you think uh, there can be any um, shifts in policy after after the elections on that any in either direction? Uh, election where in Germany? In Germany, uh, in, Germany in yeah in later Germany. this year. Uh, I I don't see why not. Uh, 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 that's that's why we have elections in the first place, right? To try and get uh, uh, policy changes up. Uh, but, but we do need to have a, a, a better story because if you if you think about this as a communications person, apparently uh, the type of uh, story that Alberto and me are telling the Germans at the moment doesn't resonate. So we need to up our game uh, and and perhaps pitch this more as an economic uh, issue. That perhaps it's a uh, you earn some money in the short term, but you do more damage in in in, in the in the longer uh, range there. And uh, we need to to reformulate our uh, uh, argumentation there. Because it's, mm. I am absolutely convinced that if Germany changes uh, position on this, uh, that will be absolutely a game changer. Mm. Alberto, do you want to weigh in on the balance of power that the Germany? Yes, I, I'm going to play again. I'm going to play again the the role of the bad guy. I'm I'm much more critical of Merkel. I think Merkel's legacy will be severely tarnished uh, by her inability to see this coming. Uh, we all know there are a lot of observers, a lot of investigative journalists who clearly show how fundamentally uh, the CDU hasn't been taken seriously, Viktor Orban, by playing a game which turned out to be very dangerous in the name of pragmatism. But being pragmatic doesn't necessarily mean you are seeing everything. There are a lot of things that you decide not to see and not to look at. And then this imploded because the EPP decided to make it imploding as opposed to exploding. But this is fundamentally the political issue at the very origin of the rule of law issue today. Also because we don't have to remember that there is a special relationship existing between Ursula von der Leyen and Merkel, which is also part of the CDU EPP culture, is at the center of the current conversation. Armin Laschet doesn't show a lot of interest for the rule of law issue. He doesn't seem to be very concerned about uh, the need to change his own relations vis-a-vis -vis Central European countries, notably Hungary. So I don't expect this change. And the way in which these elections will go and whether he will actually be running them uh, will be also about this story. And hopefully the kind of awareness, which is still limited in Germany, but is there. I mean, there are a lot of circles, um, in particular uh, political economic circles, who start talking about the role that uh, Germany played in being complicit uh, to the rule of law question. So this is going to be playing out in the coming months, uh, no, no doubt. And um, this should be debated all across Europe. Uh, it should not only be a, a German story, it should be a story of everyone. And potentially new leaders, including Mario Draghi, who has a lot of other priorities today, might also play a role in rebalancing you know, the way in which the Franco-German axis has been positioning itself. The French, are, the French are much more severe, 
not as much as the Dutch vis-a-vis uh, the rule of law situation. But, you know, something is going to happen in there. There will be some political reshuffling. I, I wish I could be in one of the next European Council uh, debates to see how Draghi will be welcome and what kind of political weight he will have, if any at all. Yes, I think we all like to participate at some point at the European Council meeting. Uh, I would definitely would like to. Um, a question by Isabel. Uh, it again goes back to the Article 7 uh, and, and the possible ways out. Uh, my question is related to the stagnation that we see at Article 7 in the Council. There seems to be no way out in this case because uh, according to Article 7.2, the Council needs unanimity to move into uh, 7. Three and actually do something against the countries that violate the rule of law. What could be the options here? Would it be possible at some point to activate a pastoral clause in this regard? John, do you want to take on? Yeah, that's that? a million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things that I know has been investigated and would already be immensely helpful is uh, to couple uh, the two complaints. Uh, 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 to Hungary and Poland so that they cannot eventually uh, uh, help each other. Uh, that will probably, uh, uh, so that we will overcome the fact that they can help each other in, 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 uh, in, in the last stage. Uh, well, the first thing you can, you have to do, and that's what I really call upon the Portuguese presidency to do, is actually continue debating and put it on the agenda and don't make argumentations that this can only be done in person. Uh, not putting it on the agenda is also a political uh, statement of sorts. So we have to continue uh, discussing this, even if at, at the moment it does not seem uh, that likely uh, uh, to, to lead uh, to any uh, quick results. Second, make it public, like I uh, already argued earlier. Let, uh, you know, if uh, uh, it, it will be much harder for some member states to keep their lips uh, uh, shut uh, uh, if there's cameras uh, in the room. And my question would simply be to them, what have you got to hide? You always say in public that you're so much uh, rule of law uh, uh, defending, so show us. Uh, uh, eventually, we will have to, uh, 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 we will have to win the argument uh, based on uh, 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 to what extent our arguments are going to be convincing, right? Uh, this four fifth that Isabel was referring to is a, is a high bar, uh, but it's, it's a bar that should not be uh, uh, unsurmountable if we believe uh, what is actually written down in the law, that uh, the rule of law is uh, fundamental to everything that uh, we wanna, uh, want to do. Uh, and uh, we have to, to, to try and keep on trying in that uh, respect. But then, and, and that's the final point, don't overestimate Article 7. There's many other uh, ways uh, that can be much more effective. Tu was already making a great pitch about how uh, the conditionality regulation, whenever it enters into force, in my view, it has already entered into force and it can be used uh, immediately. How that can be a game changer. Perhaps uh, uh, if we have this conversation again in two years from now, and I hope we'll have that in, in the same uh, composition, we will no longer be talking about Article 7 because it has become irrelevant because of uh, other tools simply being used more effectively. Hmm. Is there, do you think, a chance that uh, this will just, uh, I mean, Hungary and, uh, and Poland will just be able to drown it uh, because there is no progress and, and uh, eventually uh, countries will have to, the, the process will just have to cease because nothing's happening for years and uh, what would they be the political implications for that? I, I, I think that by it you mean Article 7, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that would be extremely damaging, starting it and then not seeing it through. Uh, uh, there's a very simple way for them uh, to get off the hook, and that is simply change course at home and uh, fall in line with European Union uh, law and with all the obligations that they've signed up. Uh, so that is the, 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 the royal route. Uh, it would be absolutely devastatingly damaging to discontinue uh, this, and I would uh, absolutely not be in favor of that. Uh, it's better to have a conversation that, uh, at least to keep it on the agenda. So again, I call upon the Portuguese presidency to do so. Uh, uh, but uh, discontinuing it, uh, there's, there's really no reason uh, uh, at all. Hmm. Uh, we have five more minutes left, so I just, uh, just suggest to have a final round with everyone. Um, from our quite 
interesting, very interesting uh, discussions uh, so far. Um, you know, what would what would you highlight? What would be um, for you the number one priority to keep uh, rule of law on the EU's agenda and somehow uh, make enforcement uh, implementation of rules more effective? To please. Um, thank you. I think I would go back to my first point, actually, and um, urge the Commission to now really make use of, of the new tool of the rule of law conditional mechanism in in in, in a way that credibly or that credible to the member states and credibly threatens member states with sanctions so that it can take effect. And, and again, I think the first cases that it launches will be deciding for this. So I think the Commission really should put its weight um, behind this this mechanism and behind the first cases that it launches and ensure that it, it takes off the ground. Because um, I think if used correctly, it, it can make a difference. Of course, it's it's not there to, to undo all of the rule of law breaches that has happened, but I think um, it is a good tool going forward. So I think this is um, on a perhaps positive note, um, a, a quite the potential to, to, to enforce rule of law um, in the member states for the commission. Thank you. John, yeah, what will be the two one, points. one thing for you? Yeah, for, uh, 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 there are two points. First of all, uh, I hope that we do actually put, keep this on the agenda and, and people uh, like you in, in your work uh, uh, continue writing about this because it's an absolute crucial issue. Uh, the second point that I have not mentioned, but I think that is absolutely essential here is that the European Parliament walks its own talk. Uh, like I said, I was in the European uh, Court of Justice four times over the last year. Member states uh, helped the European Commission uh, defend uh, the rule of law in front of the Court of Justice. The European Parliament wasn't there. And that visually would be a game changer. Uh, if it's, it's uh, like all EU institutions, it's bound by the rule of law. It adopts this uh, uh, resolutions by large majorities. Well, simply send your uh, legal service there too and help uh, member states defend the rule of law. So that, that would be uh, an extremely important uh, step for the European Parliament to take. And I, I, I hope that next time I'm in, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, I'll see representatives of the European Parliament there too. Thanks. Alberto? Uh, also, a couple of uh, a couple of suggestions. I think the rule of law toolbox uh, should be fully used and used in a systematic way. That means that when you are building a, a, a car or building anything, you use more than one tool. And the way in which you use them is very strategic, right? You're not using them in a very fragmented way. So the first advice for me would be, we need a sort of resetting and we. I wish somebody in the commission a legal service and in the cabinet would be thinking about you know all tools available and trying to see how to use them in a way which makes sense in order to get out uh, to get out of the unpass on article 7 using conditionality but not again in a scatter fashion in a way which actually makes sense and has a logic and the second point is to leverage on the other levels uh, the other levels are the member states the european parliament the ngos the citizens, the companies, all of them have a role to play. And finally, the glue to make sure that all these instruments could be used systematically and could be used and co-owned by many more actors, well, we need a political space. Only with a political conversation, uh, we're going to create the political will to use those tools. And that's exactly what is lacking. So hopefully from now to 2024, with a new European electoral law that the parliament is concocting, with a new proposal coming by the end of the year, there will be a Europeanization of the political space, enabling all the actors I mentioned to actually uh, feel more comfortable to use and be part of those instruments, which cannot be let only uh, to the European Commission wheel. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank all three of you for this fascinating discussion. Uh, there's still a lot more to be discussed. I think, uh, I hope to continue in different formats um, because the, the, there's there's a lot more to to unpack here on the rule of law uh, and it will be with us for the next years to come i also want to thank the audience for the great questions um, and thanks again bye thank you thank you thank you